the practical issues of online learning, according to Payloff and Pratt. The first issue in online learning is synchronous versus asynchronous. Synchronous essentially means same place at same time. So that would be a live class, either in the classroom or through the use of some sort of technology. So the classes that you're used to right now, seeing your students face to face, these would be synchronous classes. But we can also do synchronous classes online through the use of tools like uh, Blackboard Collaborate, Wimba Classroom, Illuminate Live, uh, WebEx GoToMeeting, and a number of different solutions. Even Skype could be used for a synchronous session with your students. Asynchronous means different time, same place. So the instruction still takes place in the same location, whether that be online or in the classroom. It's just different times. Now, asynchronous education uh, almost ex is exclusively online or at a distance because it would be very difficult for you to be in the same place at a different time than someone. So asynchronous education, that would be more like actually what you're doing right now. Um, we are in the same location, which is this course, but we are learning at different times. Uh, that's the beauty of asynchronous, is that we don't have to be in the same place at the same time. And many online courses follow this model of asynchronous education, and one of the reasons is that it's very convenient for students, and students like that availability of having an asynchronous option for learning. So there can be challenges of both synchronous and asynchronous education. With synchronous education, one of the biggest challenges is technology. Uh, if your technology fails, then your synchronous education is going to be very difficult online. Um, with synchronous education, it's also difficult, it, or it can be difficult, to ensure that all the students are on task because you're not looking at them, you just see them in the virtual classroom. Uh, now, with asynchronous education, uh, some of the challenges that exist is time. Uh, you know, a period of time can pass between communication between teacher and student, so you don't get that instant gratification. Uh, another challenge of asynchronous education is the motivation of the student. Uh, because it is asynchronous, uh, the student needs to be very self-motivated in order to, to succeed in asynchronous education. However, there are some advantages to both synchronous and asynchronous. Synchronous education has great advantages because you still get that same place, same time aspect. Even though you may be doing this virtually, you still get to hear and sometimes even see your students if you're using video uh, live. And you can answer questions right there, provide immediate feedback, and get immediate feedback from your students. With asynchronous education, one of the advantages is the whole aspect of time as well. Uh, a student can learn at their own time during asynchronous education. So if a student's not available during traditional hours, then they can do their work at night or on weekends or when they do have time available. So you can see that there are many advantages and disadvantages to both synchronous and asynchronous education. <clears throat> Teaching time. Uh, Time online versus time offline. This is somewhat difficult to manage for first-time teachers. How much time should I be spending in the online classroom? How much time should I not be spending in the online classroom? It's kind of a difficult balancing act because a lot of people, when they first start teaching online, feel that they have to be in their classroom all the time. They have to be in their online classroom all the time, which simply isn't true. You need to set up times to go in there and kind of stick to a schedule. Instructor accountability. So we have to hold ourselves accountable for the class as well. We have to ensure that we're not creating the course and then just letting it go. We have to make sure that we actually go in, we follow the course, we uh, participate with the students, we communicate with them, and don't leave them out there alone. And setting office hours online, letting your students know exactly when you're available. So if they do need to get in touch with you, letting them know the appropriate hours to call or email, and letting them know that you'll be available during those times. So if you set up uh, office hours virtually, you could even sit in a Wimba classroom or an Illuminate classroom and have students come in and do a virtual chat or a live, uh, a live video chat with you and give them that, uh, that option of being able to see and hear you live. 
and also setting offline boundaries. So letting students know that if they do try to contact you outside of your regular hours that they may not get a hold of you and they might not get a response until you're back in those uh, quote-unquote office hours. So uh, if, if you do set a kind of schedule like that make sure that your students are well aware of it and you have and if you have to deviate from that schedule make sure that they're aware of that as well. Administration time. In a face-to-face -face course you can see these are some of the uh, typical work schedules that you could expect in a face-to-face -face course. About two hours of, of uh, per week of prep, two and a half hours of week per class time, uh, two to three hours per week in interactions with your students for a total of six to seven hours. Uh, now this is for a traditional face-to-face -face course. And this actually comes out of Payloff and Pratt's book. You can see the citation down at the bottom. Now when you start looking at an online course, you still have your two hours a week per prep. However, you move up to about two hours per day of class time. Uh, the reason for the shift in this is because now you're doing a lot more reading, a lot more typing, and we read and type a lot lot slower than we can speak and listen. Uh, so that accounts for some of the increase in the class time there. Two to three hours per week in interactions with your students for a total of 18 to 19 hours per week. And what you'll start to see happen is as you teach more and as you get better at this, your online admin time will start to go down over time because you'll become better and more proficient at doing these things. Interaction time. Um, you can go to the course and maybe download and read uh, read your threaded discussions without being physically connected to the course or even print them out. Uh, printing messages and reading them later on paper is sometimes easier than people. Some people prefer to read things on paper rather than reading them on a computer. And take time making your responses, especially if you're asking your students to make, to make well thought out responses to you, make sure that you're taking the time to make well thought out responses to them. And it can help sometimes to prepare your responses in a word processor because this will allow you to much more easily edit your responses. You can also spell check, grammar check, things like that, especially if you're requiring your students to do the same. We want to be a good, uh, we want to be a good model for our students groups in online courses. When should groups be used? This is kind of a personal decision and you'll find the appropriate time to use these. Just remember that group work does work fairly well online. Um, it helps to make feel, students feel a little more connected to each other and to the course. So just try to find some appropriate times when you can use group work in your class. And strike a balance between group work and individual work but try not to overload students with group work because again one of the features one of the great parts about online education is the convenience and let's face it working in groups is not exactly the most convenient thing in the world but it is highly effective so make sure we kind of balance out the group work and the individual work making group members accountable uh, and creating groups. These are two very important things. Uh, making your group members accountable, perhaps maybe using some sort of group evaluation. Uh, a group grading rubric could be very useful to this. And one strategy that people employ for this is they actually give the rubric to the group members and have them evaluate each other person in the group to ensure that everyone is participating. Creating groups um, can be done in a couple of different ways. Uh, you can allow the students to group themselves, you can group them into groups, and some LMS systems also allow you to randomly assign people to groups so that you can mix the groups up each week or each month or each class, however you want to do it, to ensure that they're getting a mix of working with different people. Security is an issue. Uh, make sure to use antivirus and spyware programs on your computer. You don't want to pass things like that along to your students and vice versa. You don't want students passing those things along to you either. As an online teacher or an online student, the worst thing that can happen to you is for your computer to go down because now you have to find an alternative way to be able to log on to the course and complete your work. Never share your passwords with anybody and encourage your students to do the same. Uh, that password is your ticket, your key into the course and should never ever be shared with anyone. Uh, you, don't want to allow you don't want to allow people access to student information such as grades, names, homework assignments, threaded discussions, journals, things like that. And that, those are things people would have access to if they had your password. 
uh, protect student information. Again, this goes hand in hand with, with sharing your password, but also protecting student information when you're logged into the course. If you have to walk away from your computer and you're logged into your course, do one of two things. Either lock your computer or log out of the course. It'll only take you a few seconds to log back in to the course or only take you a few seconds to unlock your computer, but it can save you huge headaches. Watch your file uploads. Make sure that you're uploading files that are easily downloadable by the students, so don't upload anything too huge. Uh, we, still, we still do have people out there on dial-up connections. And also make sure that the files you're uploading are safe, that, they're not, that they don't have viruses or spam, or, or, or I'm sorry, not spam, but uh, any type of spyware associated with them. So a good antivirus or spyware program will help protect you and your students. And remember FERPA laws, this applies more to higher education, but also in, in, in K-12 education, remember your HIPAA laws and your student privacy laws, and the, and the CIPA Act as well, the, Ch the uh, Children Information Protection Act. So if you have any questions about, uh, about the practical issues of online education, and, and for that matter, this, this is your discussion board post as well, please post your questions and your answers to these questions in the discussion below.